Hello and welcome, Liam the Music Reviewer, founder of the Nurse Shark Appreciation Society here, and today we're going to be talking about the posthumous release from Little Peep called Come Over When You're Sober Part 2. I'll just be calling it Part 2, and I'll be calling Come Over When You're Sober Part 1, just Part 1, just for the sake of it, so I don't end up rotting your brain. But yeah, Little Peep, regardless if you loved him or hate him, was undeniably a huge name in the Seven Cloud rap scene, um, an influential one as well. I think a great deal of that comes from the fact that he really did push those emo influences in his music as far as he could go, um, to the point where he would interpolate certain artists like the Microphones, Beach House, the Postal Service, all artists that are either in the emo genre and are staples of them or just are very evocative acts and I think he managed to kind of interestingly use them and definitely made it feel kind of different to a vast majority of Seven Cloud Trap Rap as far as I'm concerned. Last year's predecessor part one um, garnered quite a lukewarm reception if I'm being perfectly honest. A lot of big names found it sort of like melodramatic to the point that it was great and just that it was just a bit too amateurish and just was maybe just a bit banal but for me I was quite a big fan of it. Um, I found Little Peep's delivery quite amateurish but very passionate which um, was quite a good payoff um, and the kind of case of sound palette um, again was very satisfying. It, it almost worked to like a hypnotic effect. Um, it's pretty much one of the main reasons why I regard it as one of my favourite albums of last year. I don't know where it would rank but um, I think I might be alone in saying that it was like probably like top 50 for me. I just, it's, it's an album that I've came back to quite frequently and yeah, it's one of my, one of my most played um, albums on Last FM for a reason. Just got a great deal of fondness for it. Regardless of what you made of Peep's music though, the news of his passing last November was just harrowing and unexpected. Sure, he did have tattoos on his body that said that he wants to die young and that, but no one really thought that he was going to actually end up overdosing and just the fact that on the day of his passing he posted on Instagram saying when I die you'll love me and um, it's just just very chilling um, and brought up some very some very important discussions about um, just kind of like drugs and mental health um, which were, were very um, essential but um, like I say the news of his passing was something that um, everyone was quite shocked and upset by regardless of their stance on him as a musician. So once everything seemed to return to some level of normality as much as it can be after somebody passes people were kind of pondering is there going to be any new music, is there going to be some stuff um, that he made before he passed. Um, Pete had mentioned before that part two was in in some stage of development it was being made um, and as this album exists you can tell that a lot of the vocals were already finished but people were thinking is the actual music surrounding it or even the vocals themselves are they too rough or they need to kind of fit the state to be published and matters weren't helped by the fact that the first posthumous cut um, that anyone heard from Little Peep was actually a, a collaboration with um, XXX Tentacion, another young musician who died and that's it. That is the only correlation between those two artists. There was no previous plans to the knowledge of anyone that these were these artists were ever going to collaborate. I can't think that they ever would considering that Pete was quite notably a, a bisexual musician. Ex had bragged about beating up a gay man. Um, I, I really don't see why, why their path would ever cross and it just seemed like a really shady business move why this song ever was made. Um, and yeah, it kind of put like a sour taste in everyone's mouths thinking, well, if this is what they think is like worthy of being the first song we hear of him, then maybe the rest is going to like m- kind of make us even more sour at the end of it. But thankfully, thankfully, it's it's inclusion on this album is in the bonus, a bonus track. Um, so I can absolutely red con it as I'm, I'm only reviewing the standard release of it. So... Yay! Controversy aside, I was most interested in seeing how Peep's sound would change in part two, how much of it would be Peep's creative input and how much it would just be Smokesack filling the blanks. Of course, the only person that will know the answer to that latter part is Smokesack himself and maybe some people surround them, maybe Tracer or something like that. But there's, I, I think there's undeniably been some kind of like steps taken in various directions. Lead single Cry Alone shows off a more noughties alt-rock flair with more lively guitars opposed to the more broody 
ominous guitar work that was usually used on part one and um, there's a definite kind of grunge lineage that runs through it and it greatly benefits from it especially little peeps delivery it's really strengthened by all that pent up rage that he's showing off here when he's talking about people from his hometown just that sort of um, aggression it's, it's very sort of like naughty's pop punk grunge sort of like angst and that and i think it works off remarkably well it's the closest that peep probably would come to getting like a traditional hit on a radio station not just like oh um, with a, a rap chart that like genuinely would have been the most sort of accessible track he would have made so far um, and I just think it's utterly irresistible with that hook, it's just so catchy uh, I really hadn't stopped playing it since I had reviewed the track a few weeks ago and even when we're not working with that alt-rock framework, there's at least a song like Fingers, which along with the usual trap, hi-hat, snare um, sort of framework has also got these like really lovely swelling strings um, which gives it a real sort of like epic feeling ending definitely feels like a good finale and then there's also something like hate me which again along with that sort of trap production and um, has this more up upbeat like a paint going on for it so again there's some rare but nice touches of just some more joyous instrumentation which never really detracts from the overall mood that the album's seeking out for apparently though most of the songs that were recorded for part two was in the same session that all of part one was recorded in so it's no surprise to see that again that sort of more dreary mood um, that part one's got going for it does sort of seep into this as well I think a lot of the time so it's it's not to any sort of satisfying result something like uh, I don't give a fuck has this kind of Josh Frusciante guitar which I found quite nice but bar that it's very sort of one note in trap and the same can be said about the song White Girl and Leaning. That being said though the latter song there has this really nice lo-fi bubbling going on near the end of it um, which was a nice little touch and totally salvage the song by any means um, but I thought it was sort of like a, a little redeemable trait that means that um, there was definitely kind of like some there, there was some teases of something really good there but um, maybe maybe smokes that just didn't go far enough on like making good of that sort of like potential with in terms of his production there and opener broken smile just is just a damp squib um it feels like a really cheesy remnant of the 2000s um i guess if you have nostalgia for that you might find some sort of appeal from it but for me kind of got things started off in sort of a a weak note um and then there's a song sex with my ex which um is a bit is a bit mid like there's definitely some sort of like standard production being used um but at the same time i don't know like there's this like really nice prominent guitar which um is a nice addition um and like i say it's kind of used more frequently throughout it so it doesn't feel like a really um underused element of it um also thought it'd be worth mentioning how at the start of this song uh, peep sounds a fair bit like a uh, mark coppice and um, with his delivery um which again i think shows that he was going more towards a rock sort of direction with his music and um, which i find interesting i don't think the album ever fully goes with that i think it's trying to keep one foot in sort of what peep's legacy was in and the other foot and kind of like this is what could have been um and maybe that might feel a bit sort of underwhelmed for some people for me i wish they kind of just went a bit more with it um but i do think that's i think it's a natural evolution because i've always thought that um blink 182's sort of like melancholic angsty um nature would have always been sort of like an influence for people that had been um, intentional or not on the positive side though we do get some progression with that trap sound that i'm talking about which comes in the form of life is beautiful and it just reaps so many rewards because of this change there's these shimmering midi keys creaking string sections which are all like really emphasized with this hazy aesthetic which just feels like a more mature developed take on what peep was doing prior i think it's easily the most interesting song of this entire album and probably just one of the most interesting cuts out of peep's entire discography as of yet um i think that it just shows off this sort of gallows humor and really seeing optimism in the way that peep goes about using them if uh, doesn't feel too janky or inorganic um it just he, he starts to take on the problems of people other than himself and um, which again some people found um Pete being quite melodramatic and this seems like something where he did show a lot of empathy and managed to kind of bring in some interesting insight to his music 
workplace brutality, depression, trite jobs, illnesses are all topics that are brought up during this um, song and it never feels like they're they're usually quite brief, not full of any sort of like annoying jargon or kind of like stretched out to the point where the kind of any emotion is sort of sterilised from it. They're all talked about quite satisfyingly and in a way that Pete would be able to um, and I just I thought that was quite um, kind of like evocative um, as well as the fact that like there's quite a nice at the course it feels like a sort of discussion is going on uh, maybe it was probably unintentional because this song was made before Pete's passing where like Pete's talking to his fans being like we all meet the same fate I'll see you soon um, and again there's like there's some sort of like new light shined on some of these lyrics because of his passing um, but I, I found it sort of like um, I could see it being sort of canon to people that like like who, who's lives were changed um, by his music so it does feel like a really important cut and um, again maybe you're not a huge fan of it there is some complaints um, that I've seen directed towards this saying it's quite overproduced but I don't really see it being directed at this song in, in particular. Life is Beautiful is quite a good lyrical shake up because this album is a standard edition anyway goes on for about 11 songs and some of the topics like mainly about drugs become quite old quite fast and um, though that being said um, Pete still manages to show off quite an enthralling side and um, another song that comes to mind when I'm thinking of that is a track Runaway which um, apparently there's been some previous uh, versions of it. I heard one version online um, which I just thought sounded quite trash um, and I think the changes made to this really really bring it up quite a few notches in terms of quality. The reverb heavy twangy guitars are just a perfect backdrop for some lines that just take on like I say a newfound heaviness due to the posthumous nature of them and the, sort of the, the line in particular that I'm thinking of is when Peep goes I was dying and nobody was there which caught me off guard on my first listen and just made me well up quite a fair bit. Um, I just I absolutely adore how after the chorus um, these really weighty guitars kick in and then uh, there's this like there's this sound effects of like really heavy rain that are like really eminent as well it's not just kind of like subtle in the backdrop it all like combines it feels like a really moody scene in like a, in a dramatic movie or that like a noir movie um, and it just creates this like I say an impenetrable moody shroud of fog oh I, I love this moment on this album and this song in particular is definitely one of the strongest songs and one of my favourites. Before I wrap things up 16 lines should have been a really mundane moment on here especially how I say that drugs get brought up far too frequently on this record to the point where like it kind of like sterilizes any sort of impact or that um but whether it be kind of i think it's maybe like the madness of the chorus or like the metaphor between um taking drugs and making music how they're both sort of like coping mechanisms peeps crooning delivery as well is just super soothing um just it's quite it's quite like a dreamy delivery going on there and just makes it a really like mellow a uh, strong point on here all in all, I can't say that I'm absolutely in love with part two, but again, it took me a fair wee while to really warm up towards part one. I think it's been mentioned how, um, by a lot of kind of like commentators in the music community, how Pete was never really a clearly defined rapper, and um, he definitely did do rap music and hip hop, but he's always tried to sort of like tinker with more of a kind of like a singy, punky delivery in that, and I feel like this album kind of like is going more in a direction than anything he's made before has. Um, I think the hints that I'm getting from here would mean that if he were still around and he was to make more music it would be more in a vein of pushing out from his SoundCloud comfort zone coming out with like a kind of Tom DeLonge sort of like whiny vocal style that really croons it's really trying to hit some um, kind of heartful moments um, and going for more of a kind of like alt rock kind of like slash pop punk style um, while also maybe being married with um, his uh, like comfortable emo rap silence, um, I think that could have been a nice wee mix and we do get some glimmers of potential in this in this album. I do think there's some misplaced moments, some um, new sort of uh, hindrances in terms of how this album's put together though. Um, I think one of them could, does come from the runtime, and I'm not sure if that just came from the fact that the the label was like we need to get as much out of it as we can. Um, you may not know that though. Maybe uh, the people behind it did think genuinely that these songs all work together quite well. 
and it will just come down to the general public as to what they make of that. Um, I do wish that Smokesack wasn't the sole producer on here. I do think they got him just because he'd worked so much with Pete before and he wanted somebody a bit more reliable. Um, I do think maybe one or two more voices in terms of production would maybe made it a bit more interesting, would make it so that um, these steps and different directions could be a bit more clearly defined as and because as they are they can feel a bit sort of murky um, and as, as I said I, I wish that there was more sort of um, examples of Pete going down a rocky direction um, which while kind of married with his own sort of sensibilities um, but yeah I, I do think while there's some definite low points on here um, the highlights do outweigh a fair bit for me um, I think that whenever we do see these sort of um, new sounds that Pete's exploring for himself, they usually work out quite well. I wish there wasn't as many songs on here. I wish it was just like a sort of like seven or eight track long album. Probably would have benefited from that a lot more. Um, I don't think this will kind of win over anyone that wasn't huge on Pete beforehand. Um, and I don't know if a lot of people that used to like him before um, will be in love with this record or not. Um, but personally, I find it a really interesting um, sort of like chapter. If this, is gonna be, if this is the final thing we'll ever hear from the Little Pete Vault, then I'm not going to be super disappointed um, by it. Um, Runaway, Life is Beautiful and I, I Cry Alone as well. Like Those three songs are probably my favourites on here and are all really great. Um, I'm not sure which one's going to end up making onto my best songs um, list. But yeah, very kind of... Um, a good lead love letter to Peep, I guess, is what I would kind of describe this album as being. Um, and in terms of a score, I'm thinking uh, a light 7 out of 10. But now we're at the end of the video, so thank you guys for watching. If you've listened to this record, let me know what your least favourite song was, your most favourite song, your most favourite, just your favourite song, I'm saying, um, as well as a rating. Always looking forward to talking to you guys down in the comments below. Um, and yeah, sorry for the delay in this video and just for the drought in content, but I hope you guys enjoyed this and um, as always stay safe and stay hydrated.